Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm two minutes early. I was just sitting here waiting, looking at your comments, doing nothing. So I figured, well, let's just go live two minutes early. I know it's crazy. Um, would appreciate a thumbs up to make sure everything is working. I'm looking at all the flashing lights on the equipment that I have that runs this show. They're blinking. I think that's good. I'm not sure. Um, but would appreciate a thumbs up. It, oh, Noreen's already given me the thumbs up. So is Milton. Thank you. So I did something today that I haven't done since COVID. And that was, um, well, we called it team training. I guess you would kind of, it would kind of be like CrossFit, kind of, except that I'm not trying to do Olympic lifts or, you know, that kind of craziness. And it was mainly focused on cardio. So it was like, um, I'll give you an idea. So the first, you know, we did a warm up, and then it was 18 minutes, as many uh, reps as, as, as you can do, many rounds. And you were doing, you were first either cycling or rowing. I was using a, a stationary bike. And you would do it until you'd burn 15 calories. You know, it tells you how many calories you've burned, which is like maybe a minute. And then you do 50 feet of lunges. Most people were using weights. They would hold dumbbells because of my back. And I just, and I haven't done this since COVID. I mean, I've done other things, but not this kind of workout. Uh, I didn't, I just body weight. So 50 feet of lunges. And then what did we do? We did, uh, oh, they did some overhead presses, which I didn't do because of my back. I just did some air body weight squats and then burpees. Uh, four, then eight, then 12, you know, as you cycled through and you tried to do as many rounds as you could. I went very slowly. And I mean, it was more my hip than my back, but it's like, oh my goodness. I'm, I'm sitting in the chair tonight and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a long night. Well, what can I tell you? I'm getting older. Hopefully this will keep me younger. I don't know. But today was rough. My Pilates instructor, I was going to have a Pilates class tomorrow. And I'm thinking, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to make this. And she actually emailed me. She's feeling under the weather. So she canceled. So I don't have Pilates until Friday. That's good. All right. I don't know why I'm telling you all of this. No earthly idea. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll start with the little topic that I do each week, and this one is how to test different retirement scenarios. This may be sort of obvious, call me Captain Obvious tonight, but I want to kind of just point this out. Um, so I get a lot of questions, you know, should I annuitize part of my investments when I retire? When should I take Social Security? I've got a pension. Should I take lump sum? Should I take, uh, you know, some sort of monthly payment? What should my withdrawal strategy be? Can I take out more now? And then it'll, it'll come back down when social security kicks in, you know, when should I take social security? And you know, the, 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 the challenge with all of this is you have all these moving pieces, right? You change one little thing over here and it affects, you know, you change this over here and it affects maybe whether you should uh, claim social security at retirement age or 70. You change that and it affects your withdrawal rate. You change your withdrawal rate and maybe you should annuitize. I mean, it's like it's constant. It's almost like, I always get the feel of playing whack-a-mole. It's like as soon as I fix one part of the plan, something else pops up over there. It's like, oh, I broke that. Hmm, now what do I do? And uh, so it takes a little patience. And, and it's, it's one of the reasons I'm going to be working through all these tools that I've mentioned. I did personal capital, which was kind of an easy one to do. Uh, I think it's a good tool, but it, it doesn't get into all of these complexities. And so the one I'm going to be doing next is this one, Projection Lab. And uh, I hope to have the video out by Friday. And this is just kind of what it looks like. I've been throwing in some demo data to this tool, like a million dollar portfolio and then a house. But you'll notice a lot of these plans, we saw this with personal capital. Yeah, let me let me let me get fancy with you. There we go. Oh, now we're cooking with gas. Uh, you can see over here, I think you can see that. This is base plan. So this would be the base plan. And, and, and the way I think about a base plan is without all of the extras. So like my base plan would not have any annuities. I'd probably take my Social Security, just maybe like full retirement age, uh, you know, a basic uh, asset allocation for, for me, which which would probably be about 70, 30. Um, uh, what else would be in the in the base plan? You know, a standard withdrawal, I'd probably just do a basic, you know, Bill Bengen kind of 4% withdrawal rate, sort of your basic, you know, pretty boring, but you know, boring is beautiful. Anyway, plan. And then you can start doing scenarios in, we saw this in personal capital, in Projection Lab, they call it new plan. So you can create a new plan. I'll walk through this in the video. 
And, and, and here's where you start to tackle on other pieces. Well, what if I take whatever, $300,000 of my million dollar portfolio and buy an annuity, let's say a, a single premium immediate annuity, uh, and you're whatever, you're 65. Uh, uh, what would that look like? How would that change your plan? What, what would be your income? Now, obviously, with all of these, we're making all kinds of assumptions, right? About market returns, stock and bond re you know, returns. Uh, we're making assumptions about inflation. And um, so I see this as something that that we will do and, and folks should do regularly. It, you know, maybe once a year, not that there would necessarily be dramatic changes unless there was a big life change, right? Uh, but certainly every couple of years, this is the kind of thing that you would be, you know, paying attention to and looking at, maybe running new scenarios, right? But you you always start with this base plan. You may eventually uh, create a plan, let's say, I don't know, that includes an annuity and taking Social Security at, at 67 and maybe a slightly different withdrawal methodology. I don't remember which, what strategies does this one offer? Yeah, they had initial percentage fixed. So they have a number of different withdrawal strategies. Some I've never even heard of, like client, client, am I pronouncing that right? I don't know. 95% running to dig into that. But look, they've even got Guyton Klinger. So who knows, maybe you'd make a slight change to your withdrawal strategy, but you would eventually have a perhaps a, a more complex plan. I'll call it complex. I guess, I don't know if that's really the right way to think about it, but that would become your new base plan, right? And, but then you'd, you know, from time to time, you would experiment as, as life happens and things change. And uh, so anyway, when you, when you have all these questions, it's, you know, I, I, I love your emails. I'll do my best to respond as I can, although I'm way behind and I'll do more videos. But, you know, if you're trying to figure out this yourself and it just seems so overwhelming, just start with a basic base plan, survival plan. Maybe you call it that, my survival plan. This is just, this is just my base plan. And then start tinkering with it in, in scenarios. And again, it'll depend on what tool you use. As I, as I review all of these tools, the ability to compare scenarios is, I think, really important. So if the tool has that feature, I'll show it to you. Of course, if it doesn't, that's that's a big negative, and I'll point that out. But um, yeah, I just wanted to say that tonight. I don't know. It was on my mind. You know, the other thing that was on my mind is that in terms of retirement planning, a huge issue will be if, you're, if your marital status changes, right? You either, you're single now and you get married, you're married and you either get divorced or a spouse dies. Really significant impact on the plan. The taxes change, obviously expenses change, they go down. I don't think there's an exception to that, but maybe there is, I don't know. Maybe you start doing a bunch of travel uh, afterward and you didn't travel before, I don't know. But it, you know that, that is a big uh, life event that is kind of hard to plan for. And it came up, I was talking to Mike Piper, who's got the open social security tool. He is gonna come on the show. I think I mentioned that last week. His tool sort of uses life expectancy throughout, as I understand it. And a, a lot of it with Social Security hinges on, will both spouses live past their life expectancy? Will only one? Will neither? And, you know, those sorts of scenarios come into play in his tool on figuring out the best claiming strategy for Social Security. Uh, but that's a big part of, I mean, it's kind of a, a dark thing to plan for, right? You know, I can hear my, I can imagine my wife upstairs. Is Rob talking about when I'm gone? Um, she, she, she's not actually, she's not here tonight. Ah. Okay. Anyway. Oh, so I have a question for you. Uh, I have a, so I, I've, I've been using a new, I've been experimenting with a new um, note-taking tool. It's called TANA, T-A-N-A. -A. Here it is. Uh, this is a section of it where I've just got content ideas that I want to, Perhaps m most of it is for YouTube, but not all of it. Some of it's for the website. Like here are all the different um, uh, retirement planning tools that I uh, want to um, cover. In fact, uh, let's see. Projection Labs in here somewhere. Here it is. Oh, yeah. Look, I got a, I got a due date for this Friday. I better get to it. My question is, you know, I've done a few videos in the past where I've shown, I've tried almost all the note-taking tools. Hey, look, something shiny. That's... A problem. My question to you is, if I can get back to YouTube, let's do a poll. Would you find videos 
covering note taking apps useful now um so i'll start before i hit this and start it one thing i would say is if i did videos covering note taking apps i would i would talk about it in the context of retirement investing um but they would be more about the note taking app and how it works and how you might use it than it would be retirement and investing but like i might walk through how i use it to um uh, collect information on withdrawal strategies, for example. Um, so there could be some overlap to what the real topic of this channel is all about. Anyway, let's make sure I spelled everything correctly. Would you find videos covering note-taking apps useful? I'm just, I'm asking my community. Or maybe interesting, or I don't know what the word is. Okay. Um, I want to get to some questions now. And one caught my eye. From Kevin, uh, he said, I am months from retirement. Uh, congratulations. And I have $2 million in retirement assets. Congratulations. I don't have any bonds due to increasing rate environment. So let, let me stop there. Well, the increasing rate environment started beginning of the year, more or less. So I guess one question for you is, did you have bonds before? Anyway. Should I get back into bonds or wait till the rates level out? So my first question to you, how will you know when rates level out? What will that look like? I, su I suppose maybe we wait until the, the Fed has a couple of meetings and they don't change rates, maybe. Uh, or I suppose you could look at the yield on what bond do to your treasury the 10 year and wait until it hasn't changed significantly over, I don't know, what period of time, a month. Of course, if you get back in it, then there's nothing that says the rates won't go up after that and the value of the bond fund will go down. And that's my problem with the question. To me, you need to pick an asset allocation and there might be reasons to change the asset allocation, but for me, the reason is never because of the market or the economy. And, uh, you know, it might be because of, you know, you're retiring or you're, you're nearing retirement or, you know, whatever. Uh, and that's a hard thing for people to do. It's, it's, it's maybe the hardest part of investing because almost there, there are going to be times when things feel safe. You know, there's not been big downturns in the market or even if there haven't been any big increases, but things seem okay. We don't have a war going on in, in Ukraine and talk of dirty bombs and, you know, other craziness, uh, inflation here in this country. It, things feel less stable right now. I, I suspect that they're always unstable and just in other times it's in ways maybe we just can't perceive. But there's always going to be a part of an overall portfolio that's a stinker. It's just not doing well. Uh, that could be in ca some cases much more extreme than others. Um, but if you're going to come up with a plan and stick to it, you just have to get comfortable with that. You just have to get comfortable that there will be times when pieces of your portfolio or maybe the whole portfolio is just suffering. That's kind of what happens. The only reason to do anything else is, is because you believe you, you figured out when things will change and you can position your portfolio to benefit from those changes. And there are a lot of people that believe they can do that. I think in most of the time, you hear those kinds of strategies from people that want to sell you something, you know, an expensive mutual fund or they want to manage your portfolio. But in fairness, and in just individual investors, I know many, uh, some, that you know are in and out of big positions regularly and i've just not found to answer your question kevin that i don't believe that is a reasonable approach to investing i certainly don't believe i could make that kind of approach work so there you go all right i'm going to work through some of the pre-show questions let me just check the chat in case i don't know see what's going on Okay. Everyone seems to be behaving themselves. That's good. All right. So from Tom, my 401k has FTBFX, which I think is, oh, for bonds. I was going to say, I think it's a fidelity bond fund for bonds. Would it make 
makes sense to go with FX in AX, my Roth IRA as a lower expense ratio bond instead, and just have stocks in my 401k. Uh, he's 52. So my approach, first of all, is your 401k a Roth or a traditional? Uh, assuming it's a traditional, I prefer to have stocks in, in, in my Roths because over the long term, they're going to, we would expect them to grow more and all of that money's tax free. Uh, I still want bonds, but they're expected to grow less. Uh, and so I'd rather have those in my 401k or a traditional retirement account because they'll eventually be subject to RMDs. And, and, and if it's a smaller balance, uh, the RMDs will be less. Now, when I say that, some people are like, Rob, that's just the craziest thing in the world. If that's true, why have bonds? That's a whole different topic. You, you know, if you're young, you may have 100% stocks, but if you've got bonds, I'd prefer prefer to have them in traditional. And someone emailed me and, uh, with a link to a video uh, by Ben Felix, great YouTube channel, highly recommend it, very thoughtful, does a lot of research. I haven't watched the whole video, I, but I've watched some of it, but I am going to respond to it in my own video. I think if I'm following it, uh, it has to do with this idea of uh, um, after-tax asset allocation. I don't really want to get into all of that right now, but the idea behind it would be, look, this is kind of related, Tom, to your question, but I, I admit I'm kind of going down the rabbit hole now. I think I've answered your question, at least from my perspective. Imagine you had a Roth and a traditional, and they both had whatever, 50 grand in it in each, and you wanted a 50-50 portfolio of stocks and bonds. And so you put, like I just said, you put your stocks in a Roth and your and your bonds in the traditional. Uh, what some would say is, well, you don't you don't really have 50,000 in the traditional because some percentage of that will just say 12,500 belongs to the government. Now, you don't have to pay it right now. You may not have to pay it for decades, but it ain't yours. That's in your name, but it's not really yours. So you shouldn't pretend like that's your money when it comes to asset allocation. Um, and so what they would say is you don't really have a 50-50 uh, asset allocation. You've got really 37.5 in bonds and 50,000 in stocks. And if you want 50-50, you need to rejuggle the al allocation um, I'm not a fan of that. I don't think it is correct or certainly necessary. But I thought I'd mention that because it kind of touches on your question in a way, Tom, maybe. Maybe not. Okay. Oh, Trogdor says, hey, Rob, appreciate the kind of, I got my folks watching you too. Well, hello, folks. Welcome. Wanted to know if you looked at the Vanguard Factor Funds like VFVA and if you had any thoughts on them. I haven't, um, we'll pull it up, but I did get an email today um, asking me to, to look at Vanguard's actively managed funds, and I will. Now, I don't know if VFVA is an index fund. I guess it's index fund, it doesn't say index, let's see. It's only got 13, you know, I guess I could show it to you, hang on. It's only a 13 basis point expense ratio, so. Um, Oh, this is interesting. It's not really an index fund, is it? The advisor uses a rule-based quantitative model to evaluate U.S. common stocks. So, so the reason it's cheap is because it's you know it's got it's basically still letting computers pick its its stocks, but you know based on some set of rules that uh, the folks there at Vanguard um, have come up with. They invest it with lower market valuations, so it's a presumably a value stock. We can look at it in Morningstar. Um, let's actually look at portfolio composition. I'm not familiar with this fund. So it's got 600 stocks, thereabouts, relatively small at, at 7.4 billion. This would, uh, I assume, quantify as a small cap. Uh, low PE, yeah, it's gotta be small cap because how would you get that PE on any other? What's the name of it again? I, I, I started to think, well, maybe it says small cap in the title. It doesn't. Uh, let's look it up in uh, Morningstar. Yeah, I guess it's more of a mid cap, close to small, but mid cap, but very value. Uh, so it could be a great fund. I really don't know anything about it but I will add it to my list. In fact, look at this, see, this is one of the reasons I wanted the tool that I've got, which I think some of you more than 
don't don't want um let me actually pull this up for a second so i'm going to take a note vfba is that what it was vfba and it is a fun all right so i put it in my my notes so i can uh follow up with it whoops um been around since 2018 so this is a kind of fun you wouldn't compare it you you wouldn't compare this uh to the s p 500 right because it's a mid cap uh but but let's but let's um let's compare it to the s p 500 anyway oh look at that it's pretty even so by the way this i don't know if you saw what i did so i was in the vfva you know i was looking at this fund in morningstar I came to chart. You can then compare it, you know, to like another fund. I just picked VU as a S and P 500 uh, kind of fund, and they're they're pretty much neck and neck. Uh, the red line is VU, so it looks to me uh, to be a tad more uh, VU tends looks to me to be a tad more volatile, perhaps. And you, we could figure that out, by the way, if we go to risk uh, on VFVA and look at the, oh, no, standard deviation is 28. I, that's got to be higher than VU, right? Unless it's changed dramatically this year, which it might have. Yeah, 20. So um, it's interesting that mid cap, that level of value has, has, hasn't been that long, but is, is just stuck with the S&P 500 unless I've messed something up in my comparison which is very possible. All right. Well, I don't know how much that was helpful. Uh, I'll look at it more. I, I, the one question I would do is like, if, if you really wanted a mid cap value fund, I would compare it to an index fund. And then the question is why, why, what, what's my thesis for believing? What's my reason for believing that this set of quantitative rules that, that they won't disclose and they might describe them, and they do, but they're not going to disclose them. Will will outperform an index, and do I have enough confidence that that's going to happen? Even when maybe this factor value factor fund is unperforming, that I'm going to stick with it. Those are the really, in some ways, the key considerations. Because you can get a mid cap value or small cap value index fund, right? Um, yeah. Okay. What else do we have? By the way, if you want me to cover a topic, tag me in your in your comment and that way I can just scan. So Ethan wants to know what are your thoughts on 529 versus brokerage uh, in, in the in the giver's name, not the recipient or UTMA. Well, I love 529s. Um, I'm not a fan of UTMAs generally and I'm not a tax expert but and there's potential issues with uh, uh, aid for college when they get older but i don't like the idea of of putting something in an account where say a child or granddaughter uh is going to get ownership of it at some point um i'd prefer to have more control uh personally now that doesn't mean that they're bad uh or that there aren't reasons to use them but i've never used them now you know we have a granddaughter now and so i haven't funded it yet but we will be opening the 529 this year um, I haven't actually told my daughter that, you know, if she were watching tonight, she might get excited by that, but no, I can't, I don't know if she's watching, but yes, we will be funding a 529 on the brokerage side. You know, like if I think about, about my own, my, my wife and I's brokerage account, I don't know that I would, you could maybe separate out some portion in a, in a specific fund that in your mind you designate for, uh, say a, a grandchild, uh, I don't know that I would do it that way, but you certainly could. Okay. Joshua, I have a 100% equity portfolio. By the way, I just feel comfortable checking the chats just to make sure, you know, you guys aren't telling me that something's wrong. Okay. Uh, I have a 100% equity portfolio since I'm relying on my pension for 100% of retirement expenses. Good for you. 
Thoughts about new AVGE versus my current portfolio of VXAIX, which I think is Fidelity's S&P 500. Can never keep the ticker straight. And AVUV, which is Avanta's small cap value, and FTIHX. I have no idea what that is. So let's first do FXAIX. Let's make sure that's S&P. I think it is. Yeah. And then uh, I guess I can show you what I'm doing. These are all the questions. They're all they're all black and white because I cut and pasted them out of the YouTube thingy thingy majigger. FTIHX. FTIHX. No idea what that is. Oh, Total International. It's interesting. I never owned that fund, but I've talked about that ticker just doesn't seem familiar to me. Anyway, fair enough. That that all is sensible. So what's AVGE? Oh, talking about Avantis, all equity market. So I, I um, if this is the fund, we talked about this. Uh, I think I talked about this on the show not long ago. Um, yeah, I, I like this fund, actually. Now, it has if, if it's the fund I'm thinking of, it's got no track record whatsoever. Like they just launched it. Yep. See, there's the performance. So it's got no track record. And they effectively do what Vanguard does in, in that other fund we just looked at. That, you know, they've got their own sort of quantitative approach. Hang on, getting fancy with you. There it is. Uh, they, by the way, if you're listening to the podcast, I'm just taking my image and sticking it in the bottom corner of the screen. <laughs> you're probably wondering what in the heck is going on. Um, and, and by the way, covering up part of this beautiful chart, but I think I'm worth it. Maybe I'm not. You, you guys probably think I'm not. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? So they, they, they use a similar kind of approach uh, um, in the sense that it's not an index fund, but they, they clearly have some sort of um, computer-based approach because you can see here it's only 23 basis points. I mean, there's no way they got a team of, adv of advisors from Stanford and University of Chicago and Harvard and MIT, you know, crunching numbers at 23 uh, basis points. Um, and then if you look at, but the reason I like it, I, I haven't invested in it. Um, but if we go to their website, I think that's better. Let's see, let me pull it up and I'll show it to you. So here it is. And I want, let's see, I want to see the portfolio. So all it is, is a fund of funds. So it, it effectively, is, you know, it's got all of these funds. And so it takes your money and divides it up for you. So, uh, and if you look at it, um, you know, you've got U.S. equity is 45%. They've got large cap value, international, emerging markets, U.S. small cap value, U.S. small cap equity, which would be like a core fund international large value, emerging market value, uh, which, you know, like a Vanguard doesn't have that fund, as far as I know. Now, a DFA probably does, but uh, in any event, real estate. Now, you get down to these percentages. That doesn't thrill me. I don't really know what the thinking is behind, like, you know, let's have small cap value international 1.98%. It just, I don't know, doesn't seem to move the needle much. But I, I like this overall allocation better than, I, than VT, which is Vanguard's portfolio. I like it's more emphasis on U.S., plenty of international, but not as much. I like it's it's emphasis on small cap and value, but that doesn't mean it's going to outperform, right? I mean, you know, the whole small cap, the whole small cap value, all of that comes from Fama and French, these two professors, I think they were both professors, that came up with the three-factor model. That's what they call it. Um, see, and, and I'm, um, in fact, I've been reading this book, in pursuit of the oops, perfect portfolio. And it talks about the three-factor portfolio or the three-factor portfolio. Well, yeah, I guess. Um, here's the chapter, Eugene Fama and Efficient Markets. And it talks about the three-factor, not portfolio, but, but three-factor model. Anyway, it's a good book. It's very technical. It's not hard to understand, but like, you know, it's kind of got an academic bent to it. So it may not be for you, or maybe it is. I don't know. Um, but what they said was, you know, it's not just overall general market risk that moves the needle. It's also small companies and value companies. And they've since come around. Now they've got their five-factor model. Let me see if I can pull that up. Well, here's... Uh, National Library of Medicine, an introduction to the five-factor model. That's probably not what I'm talking about. Uh, Fama, 
French. Here we go. So French is at Dartmouth now, I guess. But here's a page on the five-factor model. And, you know, you see these formulas. They're not really that complicated. I have not dug into them all. Um, but I'm in the process of doing that. But, but all of that is to say a, a lot of – when you see – uh, a DFA or Avantis or Paul Merriman, big on small cap and value. That's all the three-factor model from decades ago. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that's worth. There you go. I forget the other two factors I was reading about. That. If you've ever read like small minus big kind of things, I know what is that? That's all how they're thinking about these different factors. Anyway, I'm going to leave that page up because I'm going to look at it when the show's over. All right. Serenity says, I have 20 grand. I've been wanting to invest since a week ago into SCHD. That's Schwab's uh, uh, dividend fund. I do own shares of that. When it was at a one-year low, I did not buy it at a one-year low. I missed the low early in the morning. It keeps going up now. Should I wait or invest now? I kind of feel like I want to just, can everyone else in the chat? Let's do this. Serenity. Uh, let's first of all, so do you guys want to hear about note-taking apps? 50-50. Really? What are the odds? Okay. Um, if you have money to invest, should you invest now or wait? Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Hang on. I'm going to let you guys answer this one. You already know my answer. If I have money to invest, I invest it. So we'll say invest now or OMG, wait. I don't know why I added OMG. And, and Lee, if you're watching, that stands for, oh, my gosh. And you can tell John that for me. Okay. Um, so Omar wanted to know about AVGE, so I gave that, you know. I, I like AVGE. I don't own any shares. I don't plan to buy it. But if I, if I had to buy a total global stock fund, that'd probably be the one I'd buy right now. Again, my hesitation would be it has no track record and it's not an index. It's their own home cooking. Makes me a little nervous. Thorne wants to know, would it, would, would it be the end of the world to cash out a 401k that has less than $200? I don't think the world would end. In principle, I wouldn't. I would just transfer to an IRA. It probably seems easier to cash in. You know, I mentioned Capitalize. It's a free service uh, that will help you transfer your, your, your 401k to an IRA. I'm assuming they would help you with $200. I've used them before. I had a little bit more than 200 I think I've gotten through all the early questions. All right, so now I'm back to questions I can actually show you on the screen. Let's go to the top. All right. Kevin wants to know what I think five fund portfolio that's got 40% S&P 500, so far so good. 25% uh, small mid cap value. For me, that's on the high side, but I would put that in the realm of reasonable for me. 10% international large cap, 5% emerging markets, 20% U.S. bonds. Is it too complicated? No, it's not at all too complicated. I do have some questions. The 10%, why stick to just large cap? Why not just put it in a total developed market fund? That's a question. And uh, if you wanted to simplify it, why not... I guess the reason you've got 5% in emerging markets is because you want to have a little more. But to me, like a VXUS would be ideal just to cover sort of everything international 
and you can just take that total 15 percent and put it in one fund but what you're proposing i don't think is un unreasonable uh, or too complicated again for me 25 percent well in small mid cap value for me that would probably be a little on the two i probably wouldn't tilt my portfolio that much but i think that's a preference that's my view Kyle and Emily, so he sold uh, some investment at a loss. When you, the question is, when you sell a fund for tax for for loss for tax purposes, does the loss show up on a certain form that you need for tax? Yeah, your broker will send you that form at the end of the year. Um, let me see if I can find an example. that I can show you on the screen. Uh, do, 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 do. It's just what? It's a 10, well, there's different 1099s. They have a div. That's going to show your dividends. Let's see. Uh, why can't I find one to show you? Well, here's a good page. Let me take down the comment. This is from Vanguard, and these are different forms. So 1099B, which reports capital gains and losses. So that that's the form you would get that would show you your losses or, or gains, whatever that you had for the year. Div, uh, 1099 Div reports, as you can see, dividends. That's what the Div stands for. And uh, capital gains distributions, which hopefully you don't have any. If you have interest uh, from investments or whatever, you'd get a 1099 int and the 10 there's others as you can see but this is uh if you just google vanguard tax forms you may receive you'll get to this page there you go noreen first of all she says i picked up your book at my local library i well first of all i ho hope you enjoy it and um, i'm thrilled to hear the library has it i've never actually gone and looked at our library what are burpees? I would show you, but my back is sore. So you're standing there and you sort of drop down to, to into like a push up position. You know, do that carefully. Some people flop down, legs go out. Others, you know, might go to a knee and then go into a push up position. You know, they do it more slowly. And you do a push up typically at the bottom of a burpee. And then you basically stand back up and you do a little jump at the end, at the top. And of course, the idea is to do this sort of quickly, uh, but that's a burpee. I have no idea where the name comes from. Oh, wait a minute. I, we can do better than that. What am I, what am I doing? We've got the internet. I'm not afraid to use it. I type in burpee and, and burpee in the search bar, burpee girl. I'm not going to search for that. How to do a burpee. This might be Burpee Girl. I don't even know. There's a Burpee. Hey, well and good. I'm Charlie Atkins, and this. Okay, enough of that. Yeah, Jeff says his wife has back issues. Banned Burpees. For me, the Burpees aren't the issue. I think what 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 aggravated my back were actually the lunges, and I think it was because it tightened my hamstring and hip on my left leg. If you if you must know. Burpees don't generally bother me. Not that I'm doing, you know, crazy burpees. I remember one team training probably five years ago where we had to do 200. That was painful. VJ from Michigan, welcome, my friend. What non-finance books are you reading? Well, I'm reading um, uh, Victor Frankel, Meaning of Life. Is that what it is? Did I get it right? Yeah. For some reason, that title didn't sound right. And I'm reading the book. Well, Man's Search for Meaning. That's why it didn't sound right. Um, so I'm reading that. Uh, I, I'm going to be starting um, Van Buren's biography, the eighth president. I think that's right. Um, 
I've I've bought a number of books that deal with math. Uh, I'll share those with you. Hang on. Let me, whoops. Let me see if I can pull them up. They're upstairs. I'd show them to you. But uh, let me see if I can. Uh, my goodness. I don't know if it's me or my computer, but something is not working. So let's see here. Okay. People that are like tuning in for the first time, and I'm sitting here not really saying anything of use and just browsing, they're like, what is this channel about? Not very interesting. So I bought... Um, Prisoners of Geography, 10 maps that explain everything about the world. I think I may have mentioned that. Uh, it's here, this one. Uh, I switched accounts because I have two accounts on Amazon, but I think I switched to the wrong one. So let me go back. Here it is. Go to orders. Oh, here we go. Um, I bought one I bought today. This is about money, but I'll show it to you anyway. Uh, this is by Mike Piper, who I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, he's written a number of great books. This one's After the Death of Your Spouse, Next Financial Steps for Surviving, Sp for surviving Spouses. Yeah, if, if my wife sees that I bought this, then she's really going to be wondering. I'll have to tell her. I'll have to do a full disclosure. Uh, and then I've, I've got a couple others that I wanted to share with you. Can, why can't I find them? That's so weird. Metaverse is another one. Um, but there were some good math books that I bought that I wanted to mention. I can't remember the names. They're upstairs. But I can't find them in my order history. Oh, here we go. So one was, uh, I'll show both of these real quick. Here we go. Fantastic Numbers and Where to Find Them, A Cosmic Quest for Zero to Infinity. Looks interesting. I love this kind of stuff. And then, um, let's see. The other one, here it is. The Big Bang of Numbers, How to Build the Universe Using Old Math. That one sounds fascinating. Just came out. There you go. All right. Yeah, uh, so Greg points out that FI Calc, which is an app we've looked at before, and he doesn't show the 4% rule working through the late 60s. And my only, I can only assume that it's using different data sets for returns. Maybe it's not using the S&P 500, which is what Bill Bingen used. Maybe it's not using intermediate term U.S. Treasuries on the bond front. And actually... I've meant to email the person behind the tool who, who I've emailed before and they've responded uh, to ask them exactly what asset classes or, you know, market data they're using. It's also possible they, I can't imagine, but they could be using a different data set for inflation. So that those are my thoughts on it, but I haven't confirmed that one way or another with them. Uh, so Josh wants to know, what is your recommendation for percentage of portfolio devoted to I-bonds? More if you have a fixed rate greater than zero. Uh, you have a fixed rate greater than zero? Uh, I guess you do if you have older bonds. My general approach, I think is a, a good, a good, I'm going to, oh, uh, sorry about that. Back is barking at me. Um, you know, David Swenson, who, who ran, he's passed away, but he ran Yale's endowment uh, for many years, very well-known investor uh, with good success. His sort of standard portfolio is 70-30, and the 30% bonds are split 15% inflation, you know, hedged, well, protected bonds, I should say. So in his mind, it would probably be tips, not I-bonds, because I-bonds are harder to buy. Um, and then um, 15% percent, you know, nominal bonds like U.S. Treasuries, uh, investment grade corporate bonds and the like. And I kind of like that idea, a 50-50 split. Now, that's not exactly 
basically the split I have at the moment for a variety of reads, but that doesn't really matter. Um, I kind of like that as sort of a, a base plan that you might then, you know, change as you think makes sense. So I would answer the question, how much an I bond should I have first based on an asset allocation plan? And I like that idea of sort of 50 splitting your bond portfolio between those uh, bonds that are adjusted for inflation and those that are not. Um, because remember, bonds that are adjusted for inflation can still, you know, if inflation turns out to be lower than we expect, you've you've accepted a lower yield kind of for nothing. You didn't need that inflation protection. And if you do need it because inflation is crazy, um, then you'll be glad you got it. So you don't know which way it's going to go. The interesting thing and something that I'm still looking at, this was something mentioned at the Boglehead conference, is that really, if you're looking for inflation protection, probably the shorter term tips are better than longer duration tips. And we have seen with it, when interest rates go up, as they have this year, tips got hammered, right? Uh, but I'm still looking into that issue. I don't have an opinion on it at the moment. Other than pretty smart people have that view, including Rick Ferry. So, all right. Pavin says, I'm in my early 30s. I have, I've made contributions to a Roth 401k and I'm planning to change my employer. What are the aspects I need to keep in mind before making a rollover to a Roth IRA? Well, um, the first question is, should you roll it over to the IRA? I mean, that might make sense. You, you depend on the, on the balance and the terms of your current I, uh, 401k. You might be able to leave it there if they've got good investments and you're happy with it. You might be able to roll it into your new employer. For, Roth 401k potentially. Uh, one benefit of that is you you know you assume you're going to make ongoing contributions at your new employer. You've got everything in one place. Again, it assumes that it's allowed and that they've got good you know low cost investments uh, available in their plan. But that would keep everything in one place. It would also keep the protections that come with a 401k. Although if you yeah yeah. Uh, then the other thing is, did, did your current employer match? Because um, matching contributions to a Roth 401k actually get put into a traditional 401k. And so, you, again, you might be able to roll both of those over into your, your new employer. Um, if you're going to roll them to an IRA and there's matching, you'll have to open up two IRAs, a Roth and a rollover. The rollover being the traditional that would hold the matching contributions of your employer. Um, yeah, those are the things that come to my mind anyway. I'm sure there are other things you should consider that I just can't think about right now. Yeah. Ah, here it comes. Conscience. What are your thoughts on the chess scandal? Very curious about your legal opinion. So those of the, you that don't know, there's this scandal um, uh, that, that started when a, 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 a relatively unknown chess player, known within chess circles, but unknown outside of chess circles, Hans Niemann beat uh, the the reigning world champion, Magnus Carlsen, in a game. It was actually, there is a connection to personal finance and investing. It, it, he beat him at a tournament called the Sinkfield Cup, played in, 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 in St. Louis, Missouri. Sinkfield is one of the founders of Dimensional Funds Advisor. Uh, and a very, I presume, a very wealthy individual. And he has uh, contributed quite a lot to chess. And he has this annual tournament. And Hans Neiman beat Magnus. And then Magnus resigned from the tournament. And he didn't say why he resigned. But almost immediately, uh, folks started saying it, it, that, that he resigned because Magnus thinks Hans cheated. Now, let's put aside how you cheat or could cheat at chess. You know, in a regular tournament, like the kind that I play in, uh, people will cheat by just having a phone in their pocket, going in and going into the bathroom or somewhere where no one can see them and pull up a board, you know, a chess engine, and look at the position and go back out and make a move. In, in a tournament like the Sinkfield Cup, that it just that's not, I think, that's not going to happen. That would, well, for starters, they've start, they started doing a... Um, a scan with you know the wand like at the airport make sure you don't have any electronic devices on you um so it's it's a serious issue generally but in any event 
Uh, then other chess players, well-known chess players that stream on Twitch and YouTube, like Hikaru Nakamura, I guess probably the primary one, you know, he had comments about it. Um, chess.com kind of got involved and they banned Hans from their platform and they released something about it. And then, and this goes back to this legal opinion, this legal question. The big news is that Hans Niemann then filed a lawsuit. Um, I can show it to you. I've glanced at it in Missouri federal court. Here it is. Bring it, this brings back memories. Let me take down the comment. So here it is. Um, and he's suing uh, Magnus, uh, Play Magnus, which is a company, chess.com. Daniel, I guess it's Wrench, I'm not sure, but he, I think, works at chess.com, if I remember correctly. And then Hikari Nak Hikaru Nakamura, a well known, famous chess player. He's the number one blitz player in the world, phenomenal chess player, um, just crazy. And he's suing for like four or $500 million. So um, that's the deal. I mean, when I look at this lawsuit, a number of things jump out, out at me just as a lawyer. Now, keep in mind, it's been over 20 years since I've dealt with a federal lawsuit, which is all I did for the first 10 years of, of my career. But then when I went to the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, well, actually more than 10 years, 12, 13 years, the PCOB has its own court inside the PCOB. So we don't, we, we don't go to federal court. We make, we make accountants, auditors come to us. Uh, anyway. So it's been over 20 years, but the first thing will be personal. So you have to have subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction. They'll probably have subject matter jurisdiction just on diversity grounds, I assume, which is a whole other thing. We don't need to get into it. But personal jurisdiction, I don't know that they can drag all these people to Missouri and companies that have no connection with Missouri. That's a big issue. He could have probably brought it in Connecticut where he lives, um, but I don't know that for sure. But having said all of that, I think... Um, I'm not even showing you the law, the lawsuit. Well, I'm showing you. Here we go. Here it is. I don't know if you saw it before. The bigger issue. So this is for. I assume it's just slander. Oh, they've got libel. So there was something written. I guess there was. Yeah, there were written statements. That's true. And there's you know. So so slander would be spoken. Libel would be written. Right. Unlawful group boycott under the Sherman Act, which is an antitrust uh, law. That must be for for Chess.com. Um, I'm guessing banning him from the site. I don't know. Um, but I, I think, I think it, 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 there's sort of two angles to this. I think my initial reaction is he's going to have a hard time proving a lot of this case because these folks didn't come right out and say, at least that I've ever read or heard, Hans Neiman cheated in the Sinkfield. I've not heard anyone actually make that accusation. Now, I suppose you could say, well, they did it by inference. I don't know. I, I find that kind of weak. Um, but again, I haven't studied every nuance um, in depth. Uh, uh, Magnus did come out and say that he thought Hans, and by the way, Hans admitted to cheating, not during the Sinkfield Cup, but online when he was much, when he was younger, he's 19, I think. So he's pretty young now, but when he was younger, uh, but, but I think, I think Magnus came out and said he's cheated more often and more recently than he admitted or something like that. I don't know if, I assume that's part of the, 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 the libel case. The interesting thing there will be, um, discovery, right? Uh, because if, if those things turn out to be true, there's no, you know, truth is a defense to, to defamation, slander or libel, you know, truth. Uh, so there'll be huge discovery if it gets that far on that issue, uh, and I don't, you know, that could be very, very interesting. Uh, so I think he's going to have a hard time proving a lot of his case. But but the the flip side is this. He's got nothing to lose. And the defendants have everything to lose. I, I was always a defense lawyer. I was, a couple of times I was a plaintiff's lawyer, but, but, but not usually. And the worst kinds of cases as a defense lawyer, I thought, were those cases where I didn't have a really good counterclaim, where I couldn't make the plaintiff nervous that they could lose something. Uh, or it, it could happen without a counterclaim if a defense verdict would cripple them financially or cripple them, you know, their business. And my cases were almost all businesses, not individuals. Uh, you know, in other words, 
I didn't like it when I was defending a case and I didn't have leverage of some kind to exert against the plaintiff. Uh, and I don't know what leverage the defendants have here. I, I can't imagine there are any counterclaims there. I mean, you can always come up with something, but I don't know what kind of counterclaim they would have. So that that's the interesting thing to me. I think he might have a hard time proving a lot of the case. On the other hand, what's he got to lose? It's probably probably paying his lawyers on a contingency. I don't know. It'll be interesting. All right. I, I do think it's sad for chess. It's what a you know, it's kind of an interesting side thing. And now I don't know. All right. That's my thoughts on the chess scandal. So Thelma wants to know, if you buy I-bonds, I assume they go into the bonds bucket for asset allocation purposes, I assume, and not the cash bucket. That's how I look at them. They're part of bonds. Terry says, I have lots of cash. Should we hold on and wait to invest in mid-23? The market today was surprising, so are we? so we are taking Warren Buffett's advice. Mm, don't buy when everyone else is. Well, what his advice is, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Uh, and I would say people are probably more fearful right now than greedy. I do understand that the market has been up uh, several days recently, and I'm looking at the, the returns today, and they were up. I'm not suggesting you should go buy. Uh, but I'm not, I'm also, I wouldn't look at this as on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, stocks were up today, so you shouldn't have, shouldn't have bought. If they're down tomorrow, it's a good day to buy. And I don't, I, I'm, you're probably not saying it that, in, in that extreme, but uh, to me, if you're buying sort of low cost in funds, I just don't see the point in staying out of the market. Uh, and, you know, of course, I'm talking about money you want to invest for the long term. Obviously, you need money for some short term expenses. You don't put those into the market. Uh, and 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 so then my question though, Terry, to you would be, what's special about mid twenty twenty three? And more generally, are you are you look what are you looking for? Like when when would you view it? What would have to happen for you to think it's safe to start investing this money? What would that look like? What would have to happen? Would the market have to go down more? Um, and, and and when if you start to try to articulate those things, I think you'll find it very difficult to do. I do. I, I, I really can't. I mean, I could come up with some arbitrary level for the S&P 500 or interest rates and say, okay, I'm not going to invest until the S&P 500 is down to 3,000. It's 3,800 right now. But what if it doesn't get down there? Or what if it doesn't get down there for seven years? But in the meantime, I could have made dividends and it's sitting in cash Although cash today is not bad. What if it's not great in a year? It just, when I try to come up with some formula for when I'll get in and when I'll get out, it just, everything for me falls apart at that point. That's my view. So Kathy, I'm not going to lie. It took me a minute to come up with Pacific Northwest, but welcome. Glad you could join. All right. Great question here from Lisa. How do you know which funds to take from first when you begin withdrawals? I assume you, that means for retirement, I'm assuming. And do you change your funds from reinvesting the dividends to take your payments from the gains? Great question. So I'll tell you my approach. So let's start with the second question first. I continue to reinvest dividends in retirement accounts because they're not taxed. It doesn't matter. I can pull them out anytime I want. If I pull them out of the account, the tax is going to be the same whether I've reinvested them or not. Uh, and if I don't pull them out but want to rebalance or something, I can do that without tax consequences. So in a taxable account, if I'm going, if my plan is to spend them, that's part of my retirement paycheck, then yeah, I'm not going to reinvest them. And by the way, generally, I don't reinvest dividends at all in my taxable account, even if I don't plan to spend them because I want to control how I reinvest them. But it, 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 you know, with regard to your question and pulling out money for retirement, yeah, I wouldn't reinvest 
dividends in a taxable account. I would just let it go to my cash account. You could have it automatically transferred to your checking account if you wanted. Um, that's what I would do. In terms of which funds to, to begin to withdraw from or to withdraw from first. So th there's a couple things to think about. The first is not which funds, but which accounts. Because you have to think about taxes, right? Now, this may or may not be an easy decision for you. Obviously, once you're starting to receive RMDs, you spend that first because they got to come out and they get taxed and there you go. That's easy. At the same time, maybe you retired before you're 59 and a half. And so you're not going to touch your retirement accounts right now. Although there are exceptions, you could and avoid the 10% penalty, but let's just assume you're not. Again, easy answer. You take out of your taxable account. Um, but you know you may be in a situation where you have choices you could take out of any of the accounts and that's the first thing you have to figure out and that's primarily a tax question so there's no sort of one answer to that there are general rules of thumb um but i i really think the general rules of thumb in this case can almost get you into more trouble than they're worth and it can be a year-by-year -year analysis and there can be other factors are you doing Roth conversions this year and maybe that's your goal. And so you want to keep your tax, other tax liabilities as low as possible. Or, you know, there's just different things there. But the reason I mention that is because that can dictate which funds you pull out of. Because you may not, you know, if you've decided, yeah, I want to take out my taxable account. Well, then what funds do you have in your taxable account, right? The next question is, um, are you going to rebalance after each year? So, you know, maybe you pull all your money out. I'll just make it simple. You pull all your money out in December or January. And you rebalance at the same time. Well, if that's what you do, then from an asset allocation perspective, it doesn't matter which fund you pull it from. You could pull it all from bonds, but you're going to rebalance and your bonds are going to go back to whatever your plan is along with your stocks and you know whatever your asset allocation is. So if you rebalance you know, as part of taking your money out, you take your money out and then you rebalance, it really doesn't matter which fund you take it out of. And that's actually, I think, an important point because you know, you may, you may take out of, say, a taxable account, let's assume for the moment, and it reduces your stocks. And, and, and maybe it's this year, like, oh, I didn't want to sell stocks. What a terrible time to sell stocks. That's okay if you also have stock funds in your retirement account because you're going to rebalance, right? And you're going to just get your stock portion right back to where it was. But the rebalancing will take place in your retirement account, if at all possible, because there are no tax consequences. So you may pull from a taxable account. Like you said, dividends that, that get pulled from your account, and then maybe you sell some shares, but you know you, you get capital gains treatment, and not 100% of what you pull out is tax anyway, because you've got some some basis, if that makes sense, tax basis. So you might pull from a taxable account, but try to I always try to rebalance in the retirement account. And again, you know the fund it's probably going to be as much a tax consideration as anything else. If again you're rebalancing back to your plan anyway hopefully in your retirement accounts. Now, I know this is probably <laughs> more than you wanted, more than you bargained for. Uh, the only other thing I'll add is there are different withdrawal uh, strategies. We think about how you're going to take money out. There's, I think there's three big questions. See, I got three fingers. One, two, three. Uh, how much you're going to take, right? So that's are you following the 4% rule or some, something else. The next question is, Kind of your question, how, how are you going to take it? But but but, and, and, and I'm putting aside the tax issue for a moment. The second question really comes down to, are you going to keep your asset allocation the same? Meaning, are you going to rebalance every year? Do you have a? They call that a static glide path. Glide path kind of refers to. They usually reference it. They usually describe it in reference to your your stock allocation. So maybe you've got a ninety percent. Uh, 910 allocation, and you sort of glide as you get closer to retirement, it goes down, down, down. Maybe when you retire, it's 60 40, and do you level off and keep it at 60 40, you know, the rest of your retirement? Or in some cases, some argue for a, an increasing glide path where, you know, you kind of, it's kind of like you touch down at retirement and then you take back off again. I don't know if this is making any sense. And your stock allocation actually goes higher as you get older, which seems uh, counterintuitive, but the theory is it's okay if you're 80 and you have a higher stock allocation because the news is you're going to be dead soon. Okay, not soon, hopefully. Sorry, mom. Uh, but you know what I mean. You're For planning purposes, you're not going to live as long as you did you were when you were 60, 65. 
So some would argue um, uh, a rising equity glide path. Uh, Kitsis and Boyd Fowle have made that argument. I don't know how strongly they are on that today, but that was one of their, their they wrote a paper and one of their things. Uh, and uh, there's some there's it may, there's some logic to it. The idea is, yeah, you 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 may have more bonds um, in like the first five or ten years of retirement, but that's okay because maybe they'll help soften the blow of sequence of returns risk. And ca- unless, of course, you happen to live through 2022. Okay, um, so that you know it, the point of this is that could affect how you withdraw your money because you're not just rebalancing back to the same asset allocation every year. Maybe you're one approach to this rising equity glide path would be, I'm just going to start spending my bonds. So I'm not going to rebalance. I'm just going to spend out of my bond portfolio first 10 years of retirement. I might have, you might not go to hundred percent stocks, but you know, as you're spending down your bonds and not rebalancing your equity glide path is going up, right? So that's one approach. Another one is, you know, a declining, you don't just level off at retirement. See, this is the official level off hand signal your glide path continues to go down. And Bill Benkin actually in his, I think it was his 96 paper, could have been 97, looked at uh, a, a, a decline, phase down is what he called it, but you were, he was basically reducing the equity allocation. He started, I think at 63 or 65% equities, something like that. And then reduced it by one and a half percent each year in retirement. So you were sort of slowly gliding down. The reason I bring all that up is, you know, that's a decision you need to make or, you know, can make, I guess. Uh, It's easy if you're just going to keep it at whatever your allocation is, you just rebalance every year. But if you're not, then which funds you pull from, you you know, you can always pull from a fund and then reconfigure your allocation to slowly increase or decrease uh, your equity uh, glide path. Or you could actually take the funds in the first place with that plan in mind, so you can kind of help it along. Uh, I don't know that it matters significantly, particularly if you can rebalance all in your retirement account, but it's something to think about. And then just one other thing, and we've talked about Guyton Klinger. Uh, that's, you know, they, those are two guys that came up with uh, a, a fairly, I think a somewhat convoluted withdrawal strategy. Uh, but one of their approaches on this, of which funds to take from, they would take from certain funds depending on how they performed in the previous year. So if they were up beyond you know what they expected, they might pull from those funds. And they have this sort of uh, sequence that they would follow. First take from these funds, and then these funds. And then if, if, if you still more, you take it from this cash fund. It gets a little complicated, but uh, if you wanted to follow something like that, and I did a video on it, um, but maybe I need to do some more on that because it does get a little complicated. That would dictate, um, you know, which funds you would pull from probably significantly if you took that approach. Again, the rising or declining equity glide path, you could always you could always just take from whatever fund makes sense and then rebalance in your retirement accounts to get that rising or falling glide path. But if you're going to do like a Guyton Klinger, you can't, it's, it's, it's not, it's not just based on some glide path. It's based on how the funds actually performed. And that's how you choose where to take your money from. So probably at this point, is anyone still even logged in? Yeah. Um, so what was I saying? There's three. Um, so there's how much you're going to um, pull each, each year. That's part of the withdrawal strategy. Uh, there's the you know, this question of glide path, right? And then just overall asset allocation. What are you going to start with? How are you going to invest your money even, even in the context of the glide path? And all of those three things influence the others, right? It's kind of like, you know, you change one, it could affect the other. So they're kind of moving parts. Yeah, I feel like I went down a rabbit hole on that one. I blame Lisa. She's the one that asked the question. So I don't get this uh, vinyl at 904. You left this comment. Was I not live at 904? I think I was. Or Seth 904. It's got 1900. 704. Well, this is an interesting question from Noreen. You have an HSA. You you have less in the account. You can't invest it yet. Like some of them, you have like a minimum of a thousand dollars that you have to keep in the cash and then you can invest it. Um, Interest rate is 
0.01% seems better to just put the money in the savings account. Well, you know, you get a you get a tax deduction when you put the money in there. So that's got to be worth, I would think, you know, depending on your tax situation, of course, you know, you can do that analysis, but that's pretty valuable. And then, you know, you don't have to keep it there. I mean, assuming you have health care expenses, you can spend it. So that's what I think I would do unless you, I don't know, unless you have no tax liability and you don't get a tax benefit from it. Yeah. By the way, Noreen, you emailed me about Raisin, and I don't think I ever responded. So Raisin, we talked about Save Better in the past. Here's Save Better. And you'll see down here it says Save Better by Raisin. So Raisin and Save Better are sort of the same company now, and Raisin just operates in Europe. And I, I think it's similar. I don't I don't have any issues with it. I've never, of course, I don't live in Europe, so I've never used it. But, um, you know, it's where you can get, you, you know, you sign up for one account. In the U.S., it would be Save Better. And then with, through that account, you can get whatever. I keep waiting for this no, you know, different accounts. I keep waiting for the no penalty to go up. Probably won't until the Fed moves. Anyway. Okay. Joe says, I was surprised when looking at SCHD and Portfolio Visualizer, which I'm going to pull up. Versus a three fund portfolio, results in portfolio visualizer, SCHD is a winner. Well, you can't really compare SCHD to a three fund. That's not a fair comparison. And I'll show you why. So here we are. So we'll put an SCHD. And then here we'll put in a three fund. Now, one thing I want to note, so this is um, total U.S. stock market, 50%, international, 30, U.S. bonds, total bond market, 20. These percentages are not set in stone. And let me pull the comment off, right? But, but you know, that's sort of the starting point. That's good. We'll put it in there. And um, you can see, yeah, SCHD clobbers them. Now, what period of time is this? Yeah, for 10, 11 years. SCHD, which is portfolio one, 35 grand, 10,000 turns into 35 versus 21,000. But this portfolio has 20% in bonds. So you're comparing stocks to bonds. So that's not right. It also has 30% international. So you're comparing US to international. So that's not right. And here it outperformed still, but not by much, but, but it outperformed. Um, so it's a good fund. I mean, I own it. I, I like the fund, but I think that's a more fair comparison. And one could even argue that you could, let me see here, compare it to another fund, Vanguard value, uh, large cap value ETF is what? VTV. My guess is VTV is underperformed. That's going to be my guess. I say underperform, meaning compared to SCHD. Yeah, it did. So, yeah, I mean, so SCHD has done well. Um, even beat the s and I'm curious. So the blue is Schwab. Underperform. I always like to see if, if it outperformed, but there were just a couple of years. So it's interesting. A big part of it is this year. That's the, you know, if we take away this year, and I'm going to get rid of VTV, we, that just muddies the waters, uh, yet yeah, underperformed. So it, up until this year, up until January, it underperformed the S&P 500 in a down market, particularly with interest rates rising, the value tilt helped it. So I think it's always kind of helpful to understand maybe why things are happening, at least to the extent we can. Okay, so Josh wants to know if you owned FXNAX, which is a Fidelity total bond fund, in a taxable Vanguard account. Well, first of all, I wouldn't own it in a taxable account. But if I did, 
and you get charged for transactions, which you will. You'll get charged if you buy a Fidelity mutual fund at Vanguard. By the way, you'll get charged at Fidelity if you buy a Vanguard mutual fund, but not ETFs. Anyway, what Vanguard bond fund would you convert to to be able to, to tax loss harvest? That's interesting. Um, well, my first thought was um, just BND. So let's look up. Uh, but the question is, are they substantially similar? Because they probably, they, I think they do track the same index. But I'm guessing they're not. In fact, I, I know they're not. But let's double check. I'm confident they're not even close now that I think about it. I'll use BND. I, um, which is the, why is Morningstar not working? There we go. I, don't, I just don't know the, the mutual fund ticker. So here's FXNAX. If we go to the portfolio, I think this only has like 7,500 bonds, right? 85, 80, 86, right? This one uh, has like double that, 17,000. And if we go here, so like AAA, it's 7122. This AAA, 7431. So I personally would have no trouble. So I, I, if I were going to do it, I can't give you tax advice, you understand. But if I were going to do it, I'd go over to B&D. Uh, but I wouldn't own either of these funds in a taxable account, personally. Yeah. Okay. What is this? This is from Sunset. Always enjoy your show. You're very easy to listen to and have a nice vibe. I like that. Keep going. P.S. When will it be cold enough for the for your green beanie hat? Did I ever wear a green beanie hat? Now I'm worried you, you're on, you, you've joined the wrong show. I, I don't know what hat that is. I have to go back and look at the old shows and see what I was wearing. John wants to know what happened to my mic. You mean, hang on. I got to throw some things off my, my desk. I'm probably going to unplug something in the process. Do you mean this mic? It's right here. Which one's better? Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. I'm not going to do that again. I asked you guys. I do have a a, a, a um, lavalier lapel mic. I don't like wearing it. By the way, this one's not actually on, so I'll move it out of the way. Okay. Hmm. So Crispin wants to know, if you were retiring in two weeks with one million bucks in savings and had a good plan, would you have any concerns going forward? Well... How old are you? How old am I in this hypothetical? That would be my first question. Second question would be, what are my annual expenses? Third question would be, what are other sources of income? Fourth question would be, do I have any debt? Fifth question would be, how's my health? So depending on the answers to those questions, and I'm sure more, I may or may not have any concerns going forward. Um, if my expenses were more than about forty or forty-five thousand uh, this year, uh, I would be concerned. Particularly if I was on the younger side. You know, if I'm retiring at seventy-five, uh, that's going to be very different than if I'm retiring at sixty, assuming the same health. And so it's all—I guess it's all relative to those details, right? You know, and also, like, let's say I had to spend 45000 That was my, what I was going to spend out of the portfolio. I'd also want to know how much of that is cushion. Like, you know, do I need every dime of that to survive? Or is 30000 for necessities, 
and 15,000 is for fun. I don't want to lose that fun money, but if I had to, I could, you know, that, that matters too. So Vishnu wants to know my thoughts on converting a portion of the IRA, his IRA to a, a Roth, given that the market has gone up. So the first question is whether it makes sense from a tax perspective. And let's assume that it does. Again, I'm not going to try to time the market. That's sort of, I know I sound like a broken record. If I had money I wanted to convert, I'd just convert it now. That'd be my approach. And if the market crashes again next month, I will have wish, I wished I had waited because I could have converted the same, we'll call it 10 grand, but it would have covered more shares. But there's no way to know that. All right. Well, this was a nice comment from Raldell, I guess. Just wanted to tell you, I appreciate your video so much. I'm 20 years old and I started a Roth three months ago. Good for you. I wish I had started a Roth at 20, but I don't think they had them <laughs> when I was 20. Senator Roth had it and didn't invent them yet. And I thought it was basically vu and chill, but now I see there is much more to it. Well, there's not much more to it. There might be more than just S&P 500, but not a lot. But trust me, if you're 20 and you're thinking about these issues, you are way ahead of the game. Good for you. Let's see. What time is it? 8.19. My back has been holding up pretty good, I think. I'm happy about that. Remember, if you want me to cover a topic, just tag me. That helps me scroll through all the other stuff. Um, Wow, Lee is on fire. No taking apps, question mark, exclamation point. I thought this channel was about investing in retirement. I've got a note taking app for you. It's called Paper and Pen, you hippie. You know, I've been called many things in my life, many things. I don't think, I think this is the first time I've ever, ever been called a hippie. All right. My, I did a, a video on Notion probably two years ago, and I actually got a lot of positive comments. This was before the live stream and probably most of you were watching the channel and yada, yada, yada. Um, Sridhar says, at current rate of college tuition increases, do you see an issue to fund a 529 for full tuition? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. The 529 might not cover it. Depends, of course, how much we fund it with and how the investments do. But I'm not so much worried about that, personally. You know, it'll be whatever it is. I haven't, so the question here is, did I do the gift bond strategy? I haven't decided yet. Um, there have been a couple of changes to our cash, uh, our, our cash plans over the last week that have kind of, um could affect it so i haven't i haven't tried again since i tried it on the live show and it failed but many people have reported that it's fine but i got to tell you there's all kinds of some people say they called treasury direct and yes it's working now but the, but it's a loophole maybe they'll close it maybe they won't i don't know but i mean it seems to me if you buy before they close it i don't even see why it's a loophole I, so i don't know but but in my case um Changes in sort of what we need to do with our cash could affect us more than anything else. So am I looking blurry? Kathy says I'm looking blurry. I don't know. Here's the live stream as I see it. I'm not blurry there. 
Although I see that this microphone, let me see if I can pull this microphone up a little bit more and get it out of the picture. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, Kathy. I'll try to I'll try to stay sharp. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Pepper is shouting tonight in all caps. I have been hearing that some index funds are derivatives and the stocks are not actually in them. So they are more likely to fail. Would you know if they are referring to VTI VU or QQQ? Well, I don't know what they're referring to, but they're not referring to those. Uh, now they may they may use some derivatives for some reasons, I suppose, potentially. But if we go to VTI and look at the portfolio, and you can actually go to Vanguard's website, but they own the shares, and I mean, you know, here they are. This is what they own. Um, they do have here other holdings, seven of them. I don't know what that is. That could be some kind of something, something different, but I'm pretty confident they actually own the, the, the shares of the S&P 500. At least I've never heard anything to, to, to challenge that. Now, there could be some funds out there that certainly that use, you know, derivatives to, to, to in some way, but I don't think, I'd, I'd be surprised if, yeah, the Vanguard funds or QQQ. Omar, you just bought that book. I don't know which one, but read it and let us know what you think, whichever one it was. All right. <laughs> it's funny. I mentioned all caps yelling, and I see all these comments afterwards. It's, uh, it's all good. It's all good. Let's see. Okay, this is an interesting question. Who? It's from keeping it super simple, although based on the question, I think his name should be keeping it super complicated. I don't know. Here's the question. I have private investments such as private REITs, syndicated mortgages, land development deals, that all have varying term lengths, three years, five years. I don't know. That doesn't seem super simple. In any event, that's not your question. I get it. How do I add these scenarios in those retirement tools? Well, uh, like if you take in all of these, you can manually enter an investment. Now, the trick is going to be, uh, this would be harder in a personal capital, but like take new, new retirement, which is a tool that I've talked about. I'm going to cover it as part of my ongoing coverage of tools. You can put in a manual in, uh, uh, asset, so a private REIT, and you indicate what you think the assumed rate of return will be on that investment. So you can manually enter it. And I think most of these tools, personal capital, you can manually enter a, um, you, you can manually enter a portfolio. You can, you'd, you'd have to be able to set its asset allocation, which you can do manually uh, in some cases. Uh, but I know for something like new retirement, for example, you can definitely do that. And I do that like for I bonds, for example, because those, those, you know, are hard to pick up otherwise, since they're not, you know, traded. All right. So this is an interesting question from, I'll just say from Hedge. I love these live videos, but don't always have the time to watch them. Have you ever considered editing the best segments of these as short videos? Yes, I have. And I've done that a few times. I can keep doing it. Okay. This is a perfect question. Oh, wait a minute. So the old poll, which I forgot about, if you money, see, I, I didn't even type it correctly. If you money to invest, jeez. Should you invest now or later or, or wait? And and 81% said invest now. Ah, there you go. That's what I would do too. But uh, 
So um, should I, uh, I'll say publish short videos. Let me try to spell this correctly. Taken from the live Q&A. Yes, no. Now, by the way, the way I would do that is just pick, you know, snippets probably in the three to five minute range or, you know, it could be three to 10 minute range that I thought were interesting. You know, it's not going to be everything I say. I'm not going to cut it all, all up and just start publishing 20 videos, you know, from the, like one live show might produce two or three of them kind of thing. Here's the thing, like it's easy to cut it up and just publish it. Um, but it doesn't have sort of that nice intro, you know, where I introduce myself in the show and it doesn't have the tagline at the end. Now I could go in and edit that into the video, but then I, that's just extra work. And I'm just not about all that. So keep that in mind as you vote. So this is a good question from Jeff. Take Social Security at 62 and invest those funds or hold off till 67 or 70. In my opinion, and by the way, I would not make a decision based on what I'm going to say. I would get an analysis of this. That's generally not a great idea. For starters, there could be tax consequences and the, the tax torpedo. Google it if you're not familiar with it. Um, and also, you know, you're getting it. What is it? It, it, it? It's not the same every year, but roughly an 8% increase. Well, this year, you know, but you're getting more as you wait. So it's great longevity insurance. Um, again, that doesn't mean everyone should wait till they're 70. And it doesn't mean that no one should take it 62. But my general feeling is that that's probably not an optimal approach a lot of the time. All right. Oh, this is good to know. So Michael pointed out that in the book, which I've thrown on the floor and I'm not going to pick up again, The Pursuit of the Perfect Portfolio, they did they posted their interviews to a YouTube series. Wait a minute. Let's see if we can find that. Pursuit of Perfect Portfolio. Huh. This is great. Thanks for sharing that. So here it is. Um, it's MIT Laboratory for, for Finance. I hate the word fi financial engineering. Oh, hang on. Let me take the uh, thing out. But anyway, financial engineering. And we've got Bogle, Ellis, Fama, Leibowitz, Leibowitz, is it Leibowitz? Markowitz, Merton, Scholes, Sharp, there's Schiller. Jeremy Siegel. That's terrific. Well, that bl blows the rest of my week. Forget any more videos. I don't have time for videos. I'll be doing, I'll be listening to that. Thanks a lot, Michael. No, that's great. Appreciate it. I did not know that. All right. It's 831. So I'm going to call, call it a night, but I will scroll down. I like to end the show on non-financial questions, but I don't know. Haven't been a lot of them. The chess question was non-financial. Oh, how did how did you guys vote on these segments? Let's see. Wow, seventy-six percent said yes, they would like those shorter videos, and the twenty-four percent that said no, you just you know you don't have to watch them, I guess. But that's okay. I'll I'll look at that again. I was doing some of those. All right, I'm just scrolling to the end here. I wish I had more time. Of course, I can't, you know, with the back issue, tonight's not a good night to go long anyway. Once I turn off the camera, I'm going to like crawl out of this chair and try to stand up. Let's see. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom now. See what you guys are saying at the end here. Oh, you're saying thank you. Good. 10 burpees before you go. I'm guessing Shredder is probably ripped. You could probably do 10 burpees without thinking about it. Uh, how many, I haven't been buying I bonds for very long. I bought my first one in 20, I want to say 2013, but then I didn't buy any more until 
20, maybe last year. Yeah. Yeah, I bought one in 2013. And then last year, my wife and I each bought one. And this year, we each bought one. So not that long. Yeah. Anyway, by the way, tonight is Monday Night Football. And I think the Manning cast is on tonight. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's just good TV there, even if you don't like football. All right, gang, have a great week. I will have some more videos uh, out this week, including some more shorts, which I kind of like. I think those are fun. I don't know if you like them, but I like them. And then I will cut up some of the, not just from this live Q&A. The one thing is I'll often, I'll often go back and when I was doing it and do older ones that you've probably forgotten about. Maybe I'll even find one with I'm in that green beanie, which I don't think I was. But if I can find that one, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll cut something out of that one. So I'll get those up for you later today. So, yeah, that's it. Hope you have a great week. Uh, I'll be back next Monday at 7 p.m. Lord willing, in the creek don't rise. Until then, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.